we get to start? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to have an esteemed panel of guests here. Before we jump right into the panel, let me tell you a little bit, because you haven't seen me, uh, who I am. So my name is Swati. I sound, star, started this company called Propel X. It is an alternative investments platform. We enable ordinary investors worldwide to invest in startups and hedge funds online. Um, several years ago, I started the MIT Angels Group with a mission to help investors invest in deep technology startups. At that time, I coined this phrase, deep technology, which today is a globally understood thing. And the reason we need to understand this is because the term technology is often hijacked by information technology alone. Technology is not just that. Technology spans sectors, whether it's manufacturing, it's transportation, it's aerospace, food and agriculture, life sciences. And that is why I'm very impressed with the mission of FII, which is very similar to what we did at MIT Angels and what we continue to do at Propellex. So it's a little bit of a shout out to the FII and the ACT team and Tony, who leads the team here, um, which is invest in technologies that matter. And food is one such area. So I'm really happy and delighted and privileged to be sharing the stage with my esteemed guests I can say a lot about them, but I think it is best if it comes from them themselves. We have Enrique from Plant Squad, David from Aero Farms, and Fahim from Seafood Souk. So to get the panel started, I'd like, to, I'd like you all, gentlemen, to introduce yourselves and tell us about your companies and why what you are doing matters so much in this world today. So Fahim, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Thank you so much, Swati. We don't get to engage as much with you. So I'm going to have a little bit of audience participation. Uh, who here eats seafood? Show of hands. Eh, good amount. Who here asks where their seafood comes from? Oh, good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Surprising number. Most people don't. And for the $2 trillion seafood industry, the problem we've got is very opaque supply chains. So we founded Seafood Souk five years ago. We're a platform that allows the seafood industry to trade, trade finance, and for us, most importantly, trace the seafood back to the source. A third of the world still relies on seafood as a main source of protein or income. And it's a very undigitized space. So we're extremely proud to be innovating in 35 countries today from the region for the world. Thank you, Fahim. David, do you want to talk about Aero Farms and what is it that's so important for this world today? Yeah, and I'll start off. In there's a lot of exciting innovation going on in food and ag. I also chair the board at Every, which makes alternative proteins, basically eggs, but not through chickens, through precision fermentation, and Aspire, which makes insect proteins through crickets. Uh, my day job, if you will, is I, I've co-founded and lead Aero Farms, so we're a vertical farming company. We grow plants level upon level in warehouses as opposed to greenhouses without sun, without soil. Plants don't need sun, they need spectrum of light. They don't need soil, they need nutrients and micronutrients. So how do you give high specificity of the environment that the plants want? Instead of bringing the seed to the environment, we bring the environment to the seed. So whether you're on the equator or the North Pole, give the temperature, humidity, pH, nutrients, micronutrients, when the plant wants 365 days a year. So we have a facility in Virginia that feeds the whole country of the US and we're building more of these. We have another one in Newark. We grow plants with 90 crop cycles a year versus five. So incredible productivity. And we just built one in Abu Dhabi and we just signed an agreement with PIF to build seven projects. These are big projects, 150,000 square feet, 50 feet high, which is uh, this is probably like 30 feet high, and build it all over the MENA region. Thank you, David. So, Aero Farms, and now we have Plant Squad. Tell us, Enrique, what you do and why it's important. Well, I'll set the room. Um, I'm the veggie guy, so I hope you ate your broccoli at lunch. Uh, I'm all into plant-based food. Plant Squad is a leading plant-based brand in Mexico, and we started the company with the purpose of providing better food in Mexico. Uh, the problems that we're facing regarding health, obesity, cardiovascular disease, is something that is not only in Mexico, it's happening all over the place, and we decided to tackle that problem through plant-based food. But 
with a premise in which we created a multi-platform of proteins in which we have the non-chicken, the non-beef, non-shrimp, non-calamari, and a bunch of other alternatives for people to have an option in every moment of consumption. And that's what we're doing in Plant Square. So ladies and gentlemen, we have people here who are making alternative meats, aero farming, so vertical farming, and then alternatives or better supplied seafood. So let me ask you this question, Seafood Soup, let me ask you that. You are a portfolio company of the FII, and how has that partnership been productive, both in expanding your business, but also protecting the oceans, as it were? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll start by saying all of our solutions together is what we need when we're talking about some of the issues at priority, right? Specifically food security and the cost of food on your plate. Our vantage point is the oceans. Without our oceans, we don't exist. But we operate in a very niche industry. When Sean, my co-founder, and I came up with this idea of building a digital ecosystem for the seafood industry from the Middle East for the world, we needed to find the right partners. And the one thing the FII definitely is, is a partner. The oceans reflecting on the FII's priority report, the ocean means jobs. The oceans means tourism. The ocean means the environment. The oceans mean food security. And FII were gracious enough to have us as a portfolio company. And their partnership and their support, because they're not just a think tank, they are a do tank, has allowed us to grow platform orders 250% last year. We grew revenue 84% last year. We operate from the Middle East for the world in 35 countries because of that partnership. So Tony, Khaloud, if you're in the room, thank you for all the support. It does mean that we are able to have avenues like this for a call of action to have the, the ocean more invested in. Thank you, Fim. So David, you've raised a lot of money and you already operate quite broadly. And you have now built a facility in the Middle East, as I understand, right? which you showed, which is very impressive. So tell us about that facility a little bit. Tell the people also here. And how is the Middle East a strategic location for you? What are your plans for world domination going from here? Yeah. So what's exciting as an entrepreneur, we want to go with early adopters. And the spirit in parts of the Middle East, I would say Riyadh, places like Abu Dhabi, Dubai, is let's be bold, let's be first. So you just look at the architecture, which is spectacular, and you get a sense of that boldness and that spirit of entrepreneurship and, and being first. And that's, you want to be with those early adopters. So here, there's also high pain point in the sense of there's not a lot of arable land, there's not a lot of fresh water. We grow a plant using less than 5% of the water to grow a plant. We don't need any any soils to grow a plant. So here, it's a good fit to help with food security and bring food production locally in the region. So we're enabling food production locally and there's capital to help us still build it. A facility could be $100 million. So the fact that we have, are able to partner with PIF to roll these out in the MENA region, it helps us scale in a more capital efficient way so we could take our capital and figure out how to grow a new plant, how to reduce capital cost, how to reduce operating cost. We've grown about 550 different varieties of plants. We've commercialized 18, so that tells you two things. One, it's really hard, and two, our ambition's really high. So our next, here you could, for those in Miami or anywhere in the country, you could buy our product at Whole Foods, Walmart, like a lot of different retailers. And what's today leafy greens, tomorrow it's strawberries. We've grown 70 different types of strawberries and blueberries, and we're growing crops as B2B in a platform for Cargill, we grow cocoa. For AB InBev, we grow hops that get transplanted out to the field. So it's a platform that has higher and higher utility to grow more plants, both with farmers and for customers, for retailers. And the Middle East is a great market. We, we're building it out as a hub to expand geographically, but also innovating. We're finding, because of that spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation, we're innovating in robotics and AI there to expand in our farms globally. So, but another, uh, just to follow up on that, in order to expand globally, you do need to bring the price down quite a bit, especially if you want to expand in emerging economies. Any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so when people buy our product, and hopefully everyone's a customer, but when you look at Aero Farms, you're buying product that's priced the same as a field farmer in the category of organic. So in the US, it's about a 20% premium over non-organics, but it's priced at the same. So you go to the salad section, it's about $3.99 for a, a, a container of it. That's the same as the field farm. So we hit that price point to have mass adoption in the markets. And we're doing that now, our next crop, like I said, with berries, and there too, we believe we haven't done it at scale. We've done it farms the size of this room. Now it's about doing it farms the size of this building, getting the cost points the same as the field farmer. And if you think of LEDs, how many people have LEDs in your homes now versus five years ago, ago versus 10 years ago, that cost point's going down. The utility of running the, the cycles, having 90 crop turns versus five, the depreciation component of operating costs gets spread out much more and get, makes the cost work. Thank you. So Enrique, just moving on to you, you are based in Mexico. So tell us about your cost advantages, if any, and how do you intend to get plant-based meats today, which are more or less a premium product in the US, into the hands of poorer people, again, going to the price, and why is it important to get it to them? Yes, so regarding cost structure, uh, it's part of our entrepreneurial spirit. We, we knew we needed to be affordable and that we needed to replicate these products or animal protein with the solutions that we have with our formulations being super efficient. But our spirit was located in being healthy, healthy food. We are the only clean label brand in Mexico that is delivering these products and that has been the focus. But on the other hand, we know that price parity is a concept that we're looking into. So, if our products are higher in price than animal protein, it's gonna be difficult for more people to adopt them. That. So that, that's why we're working on it. Currently, we're 40% lower in price to other plant-based competitors in Mexico, and we're in a range of minus 15% to 15% up from animal protein in Mexico, talking about premium, uh, premium meat, premium chicken, premium fish. That, that's where we are. And, and we know that if we tackle price, that's gonna be the main trigger for people to decide to look into these alternatives, right? Into plant-based food. That's where we're being focused. And on the other hand, is building relations with important retailers in Mexico, as Walmart, as you have been doing it here. In Mexico, Walmart has a, a, a large footprint and we're working with them to be in the lower income segment of the retailers. They have another name in, in Mexico. And fortunately, two weeks ago, we started uh, introducing our products. And we were fighting the premise that low-income individuals were not interested in these products. And that's what everybody was telling us, that this is a niche, this is a fad, nobody wants these products. But when, when, when we deliver good products, nutritional products, at the correct price or even lower, consumption starts, right? That triggers a lot of people buying it. And that's, that's what we're doing, that, trying to get those price rights. Well, the price is one thing, and what about the actual nutrition? Is the protein content similar to what you would get from animal meats? Absolutely, definitely. In, in, some, some, in some components could vary, but on average, the balance is correct. And that's uh, the correct balance. You could have plant-based food, not only ours, but I'm talking about plant-based food, and you can get all your proteins, nutrients, and every component that you need to have a good life from plants. And if then you put it into plant-based food uh, as a product that we currently have, you will get that right balance. Definitely, this is something that we're into. Yeah, got it. Well, thank you so much. Um, just moving on. So. All of you are founders, CEOs. Um, let me start from Enrique, and we'll wrap up with you, Fahim. Sure. Um, tell me, what, what keeps you up at night? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Several things, but the, the most important is understanding what's gonna change the way in which people are going to consume our, fo our food, right? Plant-based food. Um, there are a lot of um, myths about plant-based food, and we need to, to deliver products that are human design center to, to learn how to nudge people to look into plant-based food. After the pandemic, uh, our industry grew significantly. A lot of people are deciding to change. But what keep us w uh, awake at night is how can we communicate better the benefits, the alternative of our products, but most of it, the impact of plant-based food. We have a lower uh, carbon footprint. We use less water. We have a, lo a lower impact in land. And this is a way in which people can change things in our world by eating plant-based food. So it's a fast pace to make an impact. It's something that you can be empowered to do. And that's what we are talking in our offices, in our meetings all the day, how to communicate this better and to empower consumers and see that this is an alternative for them to make a larger impact in our world. So how to increase adoption, in other words. Yes. 
Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. David, what keeps you up at night? Well, I'll, I'll build on that. What's exciting is, I think it's COVID. The, the world changed. People started asking not only what are they eating, but how is it grown or how is it produced? And that's exciting because it allows us, the innovator, to tell our story, to lean in. And if we, are, we want to be distinctive. So where we could have distinctive product, we realize that distinction could come from taste, texture, nutrients, color, shelf life. It could be from telling the story of using less resources to grow a plant or grow alternative meats. And, and that's exciting for the entrepreneur, the innovator, to bring people into that dialogue and hopefully vote with their wallets because their wallets are meaningful and people are making choices that reward the, the leaders, the good actors, and, and hopefully less of the people that pollute, that take up a lot of our valuable resources, things of that nature. So it's, it's an exciting time to be an entrepreneur, to be an innovator. Thank you, David. So if I am just coming to you, I wanted to ask you one question before and then I'm going to ask you again what keeps you up at night. Sure. But Tell me, why is it important to trace uh, where your fish are coming from? I know you are handling traceability. Sure. Why is that important? And then tell me what keeps you up at night. So traceability is extremely important in the seafood industry because if I want you to remember one thing from this panel, half of the seafood that you eat is farmed. Right? Like the gentlemen do, they farm, they make product. The other half we extract from the oceans, which is more like mining than it is like farming. I'll say it again. The only product we extract from the earth that is more like mining than farming is seafood. When somebody catches illegal, unreported, unregulated fish, IUU it's called, that ends up in opaque supply chains and it'll end up on your plate and you will have no idea. We launched our traceability play with a group of hotels. One hotel found out, to no fault of their own, Mm -hmm. that they were serving an endangered species. That's why I ask, do you ask where your seafood comes from? Because the more people adopt traceability in those supply chains, the more we can bring the value back to fishermen, we can make sure that we're protecting our oceans. What? To the second question, which is what keeps me up at night. <laughs> I think our biggest concern, and I, with ultimate respect to my colleagues here up on, on stage, we work in parts of the world where the, f the, the fisherman in Senegal is still going to go out and fish. No amount of smart farming is going to stop the young Vietnamese fisherman going out and fishing to make money, to put money in his wallet to buy food. And because of that, we operate in emerging markets to bring technology to them, to allow them to sell their traceable product in new markets. Here in Miami today, you will be eating mahi-mahi that we sold on our platform and traced all the way back to handline fishermen in Oman, in the Gulf. That didn't exist two years ago. And that's why we need more technology in the seafood space. And then I can get a good night's sleep. <laughs> thank you. Well, that's all that we have time for today. But thank you, gentlemen. And I wish you the greatest of luck and best wishes thank for you. your